The results that we're getting are quite controversial in a way. You can't talk about the research in detail at this point. Not at this stage, no, no. <laughs> You got school today. What? Yeah. I feel like a rock star. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, Last bit of kit that I bought before, or that arrived after I left, um, didn't fit through the door, so they had to um, expand it. That was a little bit embarrassing. PowerPoint is always difficult. Yeah. <laughs> I focus on how governments or the international community deals with disease outbreaks and pandemics. Prior to the Ebola outbreak, the World Health Organization had really walked away from talking about disease outbreaks in terms of health security. And then Ebola happened. And on the other side of Ebola, everyone's talking about global health security again. This morning we've got a big meeting with a professional conference organiser for this big event in 2019. So the conference itself is, uh, the theme of it is looking at global health security, so it's all to do with um, managing adverse health events as they potentially spread around the world. And it's the first conference of its kind to ever be held, which is going to hopefully then outline some key principles and guidelines for organisations working in, in the field of global public health. The idea behind this event is to bring all the stakeholders together, bring them here to Sydney and get them to commit to help low-income countries. We were part of the discovery of binary neutron star merger by LIGO. So LIGO detected these uh, two neutron stars merging and forming a black hole, which is the first time that they detected gravitational waves from something like that. Our team um, at Sydney Uni were part of the follow-up team, so we were observing with a radio telescope trying to look for electromagnetic radiation from the neutron stars. I'm presenting Sydney Science Forum. Apparently we've got like 600 people coming, talking about gravitational wave discovery and our role in the radio follow-up. Since the detection in August, the first wave, there was a bit of a reprieve, but then in radio we're still monitoring this source. We've been monitoring it for 200 days. We actually just submitted our last paper yesterday. Submitting that paper and doing this talk, after that we have a bit of a, a breather. Having done a decade of lecturing, I've got much better at it. It's still quite daunting when you have so many people turning up. Yes. So I'll start with August 17th, 2017, when we heard this chirp of New Era for the first time. And I'll play this famous chirp. Some of you may have already heard it in the, in the news. And then... I mean, you know, we do this for everyone, right? And so getting out and talking to people about what we do and having them excited about it, that's a real highlight. It's nice to come along tonight with some students from my old school and have them say, um, she's, that was so inspiring. I, I guess I love having uh, Tara in my class because she had this desire to learn. So it's fantastic, it's such a delight to come along and see uh, a rising star in Australian astronomy. My research is on Australian politics and democracy and I look at political parties and try to understand why political parties aren't really operating in the ways that we want them to. So today is like basically the biggest week in my life uh, from an academic perspective. It's the confluence of three massive events. A, the budget was released on Tuesday, so I've been doing commentary around that. Uh, didn't go to the lockup, but thank God for that. A Section 44 case was handed down yesterday in the High Court, so that's a big debate around uh, parliamentary representation and citizenship and all of this week is the Eurovision Song Contest which uh, for some signals dread. Uh, for others like me it is one of the biggest political events of the year. So today I'm uh, giving a lecture to our first year politics um, and international relations students. So there should be a hundred or so first years in the room um, some of them are going to know what Eurovision is, others are going to have absolutely no idea whatsoever. So it's my job to, uh, to teach them how to look at Eurovision through a political lens. So, Abba, um, if you don't know who Abba is, 
I can't really help you. <laughs> I'm heading over to Geneva and the main purpose of this uh, is to go do some research and collaboration with the World Health Organisation, particularly looking at how we can identify the types of behaviours that governments are doing when they breach the international health regulations and build a database around that. But once we've got that database, we might then be able to develop more informed strategies as to how we can actually stop countries putting in trade bans and, and travel restrictions. So I'm going to be in Geneva uh, for probably around four months. Uh, I've got to say, like, living out of a suitcase <laughs> is not a part that I love. If you strip all that aside, yes, this is the stuff that I love doing. It's, it's getting in and doing the research. Um, we've got a two-day meeting coming up with uh, representatives from multiple countries around the world to talk about the international health regulations. And one of the issues and topics that we will be talking about is the fact that we want to start to increase uh, compliance monitoring. We're going to be spending um, the next couple of hours uh, trying to finish uh, some writing. Um, <laughs> this is the luxurious life of an academic. The research I'm focusing on in this project is about materials for energy storage and conversion. So specifically, ionic conducting materials for battery and fuel cell applications. I'm working very much on the actual atomic scale structure and dynamics of materials. Miniaturising everything down that small and getting it to work and getting it all in place is, is a multi-year project. So at the end of last year, I got a prize from the Humboldt Society. So it gives me 55,000 euros, so I officially started sabbatical, I think it was January 12. Or... Does, has the saw got anything to do with most of this sabbatical? Yes. You know, sort of two out of the four things I'm working on, are, and the first and the highest priority ones, are directly related to the this energy materials and even the specifically battery stuff that the saw is tied to. In theory, you could take six months every three and a half years. But in practice, I don't think anyone comes even remotely close to that. It's, it's, it takes quite a bit of organising. So this year, I started out across to China, gave a talk there, met people. It was really good. Came back for 24 hours, I think, and then flew off to the States. I was in Provo in Utah. Collaborator I wanted to work with on the theoretical side of crystallography. We got back on Thursday, Friday. Drove 18 hours on the weekend. I went down to see Mum in Victoria and then just got back last night. Tomorrow I'll spend the day out at Ansto. See briefly out there uh, experiments that happened at the Neutron facility. Try and get everything as organised as I can with my research students on Friday and then I'll disappear again. On Tuesday and Thursday I um, picked my son up at three. My son just started school this year so Kindergarten, still getting used to it, um, but going well so far. This year I've deliberately decided to try and kind of keep life slightly more in balance. Um, particularly with both of us travelling a lot, it's, it's pretty intense. Having a five-year-old and both doing a lot of travel for work, obviously, like, it's a huge coordination problem. And most of the time we're really good at organising our calendars, but just occasionally, you know, things go wrong. Um, last year there was a good one when I uh, miscalculated and I ended up in Italy a day okay. earlier than my partner got back from Perth. So we had to do a bit of an emergency um, <laughs> ring-in of my mum. Hello. Hey. Hello. Sorry if we're late. I'm recording already. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're recording already. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Probably one of the biggest changes um, that's happened was that I kind of originally envisaged that I'd be going over to the WHO for a period of about four months, being able to get access to some data and then running away and being able to write up some papers. What I've discovered since arriving there has been that um, how I thought they were already capturing data, it turns out they haven't been. So since I've arrived, we actually have done the very first time ever um, this live data capture of travel and trade sanctions that countries have been putting in place with regards to a disease outbreak. And what I'm actually doing now is helping build the data capture system for the WHO. So what do you miss when you go overseas? <laughs> this is gonna make me sound like a coffee snob, but decent Australian coffee. <laughs> 
aim of my research is to find better dietary treatments for obesity. I was um, someone who did struggle with obesity and I knew that the strategies that were available were really second rate. Health professionals don't tend to use fast weight loss because of the perception that it's unsafe. So uh, people in this tempo diet trial, they lose weight either fast or slow, and then we measure outcome measurements related to health and safety. I've just spent a day here in this beautiful um, Swiss uh, chalet kind of building, but it's um, behind the chalet facade. It's actually the World Health Organization Collaborating Center for the Management of Chronic Diseases. Today was just um, a fabulous day of learning. On the other side, there was also lots of things that I was able to bring to the team here in Geneva. We've got a few new results coming out right. and some of the team members of my team they've been selected to present the work in oral presentations at international conferences. Um, one of our team members is going to do a run through of their talk because the results that we're getting are quite controversial in a way and they are shaking up a little bit of the dogma around weight management and how we do it. Publishing the, the data is like a dream when you finally publish it because this study is more than 10 years. Getting participants into the study and ethics approval and protocols, everything, it was like endless steps. So when it gets published, it's like, oh my gosh, that is so good, but often by then we're I'm, I'm too tired to celebrate, but I'm celebrating, you know, quietly in my heart. <laughs>